Okay. I've been voice acting A Realm Reborn. I've got the first two episodes published. You've mm-hmm. done some voice acting over the years, a, a plenty of times. Everybody mm-hmm. has tried it. Mm-hmm. What accents are these people supposed to have? Because when I look at the words, <laughs> they're not written from one. It's not like when I read Shakespeare and everybody's in yeah. Old English because it's one yeah. writer. This mm-hmm. feels like everybody was written mm-hmm. like, oh, I remember being Baderon. I'll write Baderon. And it's like, mm-hmm. and we just like a community driven project, like through Rome Reborn. Is there a regional accent? Is everybody here yeah. just scattered from all over? Am I just missing um, that? Y- yes, yes and no. <laughs> um, there's there's like a central Aorsian accent, which is just vaguely British, right? Then you have a Limsa Lamincen accent, which is which is really um it's like it's like Cockney in it. They all talk like this a little bit. Oh that or they're more like this and they're kind of classic rugged and pirate, aren't they? Um and then up in Alamigo, they sound like they're uh, they're from Northern England, and Ilbert Ilbert. Oh, let me see if I can do Ilbert. And Ilbert sounds kind of like this, doesn't he? He's uh, he's got a bit of that one going on. Sounds like he's from up north. Um, and then you have the Charlians, which are just like oh, really posh, you know, uh, Oxford English, you know, up in the up in the Ivory Tower in the far north. Um, basically, everyone's English. But they're like slightly different regional dialects of English, um, and they they established basically from from the voice actors they had in in ARR right is that um, they had you know the limbs of the Minsons they were given the direction of like you're a pirate talk like a pirate and obviously when someone is given pirate they start talking Cockney right um, but then you had uh, like Raubon for instance um, before there was supposed to be like a, a, a kind of specific um, fleshed out Girabanyan Alamegan accent that were just like, okay, well, this is our first like Alamegan character. We'll just kind of like take the accent of that voice actor because it's distinct and kind of extend that as like a, like a regional dialect. Um, that seems to be what is going on with pretty much all of the, the Aeosian regions. I love that. England is, was so colonial over the years that a Japanese game has to make everybody have an English accent. <laughs> like, like everything that's has, like historical, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, that came from people that had English accents and they were the writers. So mm-hmm. that's, that's trapped. And then now we mm-hmm. have like a Japanese game and when it's localized, it still is English. Like, oh, that's... well, it's, it's interesting because almost every <laughs> single Final Fantasy game uh, in the English localization have been like all, um, like SoCal or like Valley accents, right? Because that's where Square and, Enix NA is. Yeah, that's, that's English, where their English, offices. Yeah, that's where the offices. Yeah, um, well, I mean, they got an office in London, but but generally, like they were using yeah, yeah. Los Angeles voice acting studios, right? Um, and the fascinating thing about fourteen is that ARR also uses an LA voice acting studio, but from heavens what on ones they're using a, a London based one, but for some reason the direction I don't know if I, I don't know who it came from um i don't know if it was odo or like like who made that or, original decision but they were just like no we're going with we're going with british um i suspect i think final fantasy 12 is mostly british accents as well um and yoshida in particular but like everyone that was kind of involved in 14 and particularly in the arr revival were were huge huge fans of um uh Matsudo. Okay. obviously um so i think it was partly about emulating that as well um i i noticed that you gave beta on like a texan accent i just ran out of accents <laughs> oh, episode two i'm out i'm mm. not a voice actor yeah. oh, that's cool. uh, oh, that's and i read fine. it multiple times and i just couldn't mm. get the pacing and the the mm. yes and the, mm. the ums and the just the mm. little like in writing they really did write with a lot of tone and so there's all these like yeah. artifacts of, of that are supposed to tell you how it's being paced and the emphasis on things yeah. and that's just good writing and yeah um as i read it out multiple times like i couldn't ever quite land on a pacing that felt right reading aloud and part of mm-hmm. that comes from like i have no history of voice acting and like i don't mm-hmm. do an immense amount of reading so like i don't like mm-hmm. it's definitely there and i'm like i know it's doing something i just don't know what and i mm-hmm. naturally as a texan it's easier for me to just start kind of like leaning that way with people who have like 
a lot of very like unclear pacing happening they're supposed to give them personality yeah if you want to give a character personality you just like a lean into your own sort of regional dialect like that that makes sense that's intuitive that that said i will issue the challenge um and you guys in the youtube comments can hold chris to this in in your next video i want to see you trying to do a cockney accent for the lips of the Minsons. all right all right all right all right um just summon um oh who's who who's a good cockney actor that you could you could summon oh i don't know actually but you'll you'll work it out just just pretend you're in a guy ritchie film all right I love Guy Ritchie films. Probably well, my go. favorite films. When in doubt, I haven't seen The Gentleman yet, and that's yeah. like that's like the only one. Mm. And so, like, I like specifically go and like, okay, let's make sure we've seen everything Guy Ritchie's put out. Um, okay, so so later on is Jason Statham from now on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> from now on, <laughs> I did warn at the beginning of the series, voices may change. <laughs> there may be uh, sudden and drastic changes. We were like, that's not what he sounded like 20 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Well, 20 minutes ago was filmed three weeks ago. Uh, that's what he sounds like now. Isn't it? That's what he sounds like now. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So link shells, I think is what this is. Okay. I feel like right. as we go through Realm Reborn, we establish this like kind of cell phone thing. And I've been doing my MSQ mm -hmm. roulettes as I level tanks. And like, there's mm -hmm. this ability to talk over distance and time that feel like I'm just oh, like, I got a cell phone in my ear, which looks ridiculous because mm -hmm. I tank in a pig suit. Um, so I'm, like, why are there fetch quests if we have cell phones? <laughs> like, why don't we just call? Um, okay. First of all, they're a very like rare and privileged and sophisticated technology okay. it's a it's a very like kind of frontier technology it would it would be it would be like having a, a wireless cell phone in like 1983 basically okay people with like the car phones there's only so many people you can call and it's like a dollar per yeah. minute yeah yeah that kind of idea um and and also um because you know they're carried via ether like everything else um any kind of like uh, atmospheric interruption makes them useless. Unless the story says that it doesn't need to be useless. Because yeah. I feel like there's definitely some things Pretty in the roulettes where it's like, there's lots of atmospheric oh, yeah. stuff going on and it works until Sid needs yeah. to say is not. And then he just, yeah. he always just cuts off on like the super most predictable moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I feel like I can't. And then it's like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, it just, I just find that, like I'm going on these quests and it's like, go get me a sandwich, go pass along this message, go, mm -hmm. go get my dry cleaning. And then, mm -hmm. and then like, I haven't gotten to her yet, but like, I know Minfili's going to just pick up the phone and it's like, why didn't you do that the first time? Like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> so with Aether technology, like with Aetherites, mm -hmm. when I first am in Linsa, I get a chance to like touch my first like, you know, I, yeah. I, I all but lick my first eighth right, and now we're attuned mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. What happens there? Like, at what what is that attuning? What is that action doing for me that allows me to teleport, but only once I've touched something? Okay. Um, okay. You know, you know when you've been, like, staring at a bright light, and you close your eyes, and you can still see it? Yeah. That's that's kind of like etherites. Um, when you attune to them, you close your eyes, you can see, like, every etherite that you've attuned to that's 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 basically what it is and then and then you can travel to that um now the the interesting thing about etherites is that the the ordinary person cannot use them to travel very great distances you'll okay. be able to like teleport to the other side of town or something sure but then you know you're you're gonna be spent like you're you you're gonna probably be at least as tired as if you just run there it's faster but it uses a lot of a lot of energy, um, and if you want to use it to teleport to the next town over, you're gonna have to sleep for like a day before you're able to do anything again. Um, we are massively overpowered. We can we can teleport from one side of the planet to the other because we're the warrior of light, um, and there's maybe like a handful of other people that can do that. Um, but for the most part, all of these like mechanics that we have that make the world feel smaller and make like so much of this back and forth or whatever seem redundant, you got to remember that we're we're OP, we're we're privileged and we're special. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen some reviews of the game from people that like compare it to other games and they say they appreciate mm -hmm. the gravity of how we like grow into being the warrior of light. And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't think that's entirely true because that implies that we were a normal person. We chose mm -hmm. through our own choices to very like shadow bringers of us. Anybody can do yep. it. You just have to reach out and try. And like mm -hmm. there is clearly some genetic or or aether chemical change to us that allows us to do things that it's not an issue of a mere mortal desiring to use an aetherite and teleport yeah. massive distances like we clearly are different um, yeah well it's it's mostly the echo like we we have we have this trait that is not is not unique um and we know now that at least like in theory many many if not every person could have it but they don't and and we do and is, you know is it a gift from heidelin is it something that's grown is it something that's genetic like if we had parents would they have had the echo um now see that's that's tough because it could it could be given by heidelin um what we learn in shadowbringers is that generally it's actually given by the Asians, um and that heidelin basically tries to sort of co-op it um Heidelin wants okay. you to think that it's a blessing from her because if you don't then you're gonna end up falling for the Asians nonsense um uh, seems I'm... to be the thing as I as came out like... Shadowbringers and I might be an Asian so like like I, I'm not I'm not totally <laughs> I'm not totally I'm not thrilled with their methods but I'm mm -hmm. not totally sold if they're older um, than the people that we're getting instructions from, mm -hmm. I'm not confident wholeheartedly that there's nothing they know that we would also know. Like, like does that, I don't mm -hmm. know how to phrase that, but like, it feels like obviously if they're older than Heidelin, isn't, mm -hmm. isn't it more than possible that Emmett literally knows things that we weren't told? Yeah, of course. So Absolutely. then to immediately discount him and say the Asians are wrong because we don't like these behaviors. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. sometimes when you look at two choices, they both suck a little. And so like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's was like mass murder. And so suck a little is like the, the most <laughs> enormous understatement ever. But like, is mm -hmm. the alternative worse? Because they can see things and they've lived long enough that they, they have to know things we don't know just mm -hmm. by nature of time. Yeah. But, but the funny thing is that they think that that only works one way. Whereas we proved the multiple points in Shadowbringers that we also know things that they don't. Like, we mastered time travel. And that's not something that they've ever... It's not something that's ever even really occurred to them. Um, and the other thing is that the Asians tell us a lot of things, but we constantly catch them in lies. Yeah, um, I think that makes them more engaging. That, that allows you to rewrite history if you should so need. Um, doing yeah. that I, I play warhammer 40k and like that's one of the universes mm -hmm. that i do engage in lore in a little bit mm -hmm. and like the beauty of it is that like my army and one of my codexes will say that this was how the events of history unfolded and then my brother mm -hmm. will have a book that was printed by the same company at the same time that's talking about mm -hmm. the same battle and has a different history and that's because then they go back and they say well that was those historians point of view so it gives them this immense ability to just constantly have a revisionist history um, yeah. which lets the lore be deeper because you can yeah. go back and you can say, oh crap, we got to make those. Yeah, it's not, it's deal. not a retcon. We were just wrong. Yeah. 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 yeah we just exactly. didn't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so it's, it's really, it's kind of nice. Um, mm -hmm. so then like, as we talk about the significance of various characters, like the term beast tribe gets thrown around and my understanding yeah. is that's, that's derogatory, right? That's a less than human. Mm -hmm. That's a subhuman type thing. Why yeah. does it's that, pure semantics. why does that not go away? Okay. Why now, we, I mean, we seem to refer to them as beast tribes, almost all but to their face. My my yeah. inner, my user no, 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 no. We do it to their face as well. We tribes. we 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 do it to their face, and a lot of them will refer to themselves as as beast tribes as well. Um, it's because we we created a a, a false dichotomy. Um, okay, so if we step this back a little bit, sure. Um, Solus Zos Galvis, the founder of the empire of the Gallian Empire, he was Emmet Selk, right? Okay. <laughs> he he was he was he was I an ass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um and as the Galians went about conquering the world, they came to this place that was completely devoid of life, right? And he looked out on it and he said, "Look at that everyone. 
that's what primals do. Primals can create such incredible destruction. They're the only things that can oppose us. You hear me, everyone? Please don't summon primals. That would be terrible. <laughs> okay. um, did, did everyone in the back hear that? Don't summon primals. I'd, I'd be <laughs> in real trouble if you started summoning primals. Um, he was lying. Um, it was deliberate. He wanted everyone to start summoning primals. Um, and then the people that did start summoning primals, uh, he was like, well, they're, they're beast people. They're beast tribes. They can, they can do that because they're not, they're not human. They're not, they're not like us. And it was basically to, to sow dissent between what had previously been usually like fairly cordial relations between, um, races that were living in the same like geographic locations is that suddenly you're you're creating um again an artificial dichotomy between them you're saying these ones are actually uh, beasts these ones are humans you can tell the difference because the beasts can can summon primals and then the galleons that that eat this up say well we need to eradicate all of the beast tribes and anyone that defends them we're going to eradicate them as well because of this fear that's been instilled in them um, of the primals. So Gaius, um, I, I believe it was basically Gaius that coined the term in Aeorzea of Beast Tribes. And, and he said, um, you know, like, we're, we're here, we're going to destroy the Beast Tribes, we're going to destroy the primals, um, and anyone that gets in our way, we're going to destroy them as well. So cast them out, turn them over to us, whatever. And basically, in that fear, although the Aeorzeans didn't surrender, they started kicking all the Amaljar and Kobolds and everyone out of their cities. Um, Okay. And that's basically where where you came with the term. So beast tribes are not are not a thing. They're not real. They're just other spoken races. Um, and, and the how distinction do we which ones were worth being racist against, which ones weren't, because we have Lala's and we have. Yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Roth now. I'm a Viera. Mm -hmm. Like I can mm -hmm. be a Lala, and like those are mm -hmm. all fine. But like if I was an Amal Jah, mm -hmm. like I'm this like secondary class. Because the Amal Jah summon a free. It was it was all about. Okay. having the ability to summon primals. And that's why um, in ARR, in uh, Coil, right, when we find out that Louis Swa became Phoenix, um, Alfino and Alizé are like, oh shit, humans can summon primals as well. Elizan can summon primals as well. Um, we cannot let anyone ever find this out because... You know, if if the people in Uldar know that they can summon primals, then they will start summoning primals. Um, so they actually sort of decided to cover up the distinction between beast races and and non beast races. So it's now, so of it's course, even it, dumber than just simple yeah. racism. Like it's it's even yeah. more just yeah. stupid and pointless. And it yeah. seems weird that my literal user interface perpetuates it, right? I have like mm -hmm. a beast tribe reputation thing to just yeah. further immersion that my gameplay yeah. element literally uses mm -hmm. a label that should mm -hmm. really be offensive mm -hmm. and is yeah. drastically overlooking things. Yeah. Uh, um, and then, well, I mean, now, like, honestly, not long after... Um, the the revelations with Bahamut, you get Izael Iceheart summons Shiva. She's an Elizan. She does that. Then you know people start like we we have some some Alamegans uh, in two point that are planning to summon Ralga but don't. Um, eventually, like the lie is revealed, but the damage has already been done in forging that that kind of um, again that false dichotomy that racial distinction between the two categories. Um, and ever since then, we have been working to like the whole point of the Beast Tribe quest is kind of like working to bridge that gap um, and working to like eliminate that distinction. But it's just it's it's slow work, basically. OK, so without zooming out too much outside of gaming, because one of the beauties of gaming mm -hmm. is that we can have these very complex conversations about <laughs> stress without being aware of the real world. I I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm American. I'm, I'm proud to be American. Mm -hmm. I was born American and we always get everything right. And the rest of the world should follow our example. And we're always perfect in every way. And there's never any controversy here. It's wonderful. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, it's going great. Uh, so good. <laughs> everybody <laughs> is just getting along over here and we're holding hands. I hope that your media gets it because we are mm -hmm. just loving on mm -hmm. each other. Yeah, um, oh, absolutely. And 
in the game, like we land in Lemsa and like, or we land in Old Daw and we immediately ally ourselves somewhat with that city state. And then I assume mm-hmm. that my grand company is allowing me to kind of alter that alignment a little bit later. I haven't gotten that far, but, mm-hmm. but like what gives us the confidence that we allied with the right side of this during AR? What gives me, like, couldn't I have just as easily have appeared on a boat going to the Garleans? Like, like, how do I know? You didn't. That you done. The, you didn't. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure we're fighting for the, the right side. But, like, I've only been presented the one side at this point in the story. Mm-hmm. Um, you you are demonstrated, like, from very early on in ARR, regardless of where you start, that you, you did not pick the right side. That within the side that you picked, there are factions that are, that are good. Um, there, there are factions that are well-meaning, but like Limsa Lominsa, for instance, um, they, uh, their city was founded by an armada that was fleeing a war and crashed in Vilbrand and they, you know, basically took the wreckage of their ships and started to build, you know, cottages and, and stuff like that and started fishing and trying to farm and ended up like pirating and stuff like that. But the kobolds were already there. There were already an indigenous people there and they took their lands and they started pushing them further and further and further and further and further back until they made a treaty with them that was like, here's the line, this is ours, this is yours. And ever since then, the Lumincens haven't haven't been respecting that. They've been constantly like taking right. more and more and more from them. Right. Um, and you learn that pretty, pretty early on. The Scions are kind of calling them out on that. So the idea is like you start somewhere because it looks cool, it looks interesting, <laughs> and then you realize very quickly that 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 all of these cities are are deeply problematic and deeply corrupt. And um you, as do the Scions, want to like distance yourselves from them, like more and more and more. Um, and try and help like solve those those problems. That's basically what the circle of knowing is about. Why Louis Soir first came to Eorzea is like, you know, Eorzea is you know mo- mostly good, but there's all these problems, these divisions, these corruptions, and we're going to try and tackle them one at a time. Do people know? Is like one last question. Do people know mm. who the Scions are? Are we like a UN where we're like big in public, or are we more like the X Men where we're kind of hiding you're, underneath a basketball court like what's yeah i mean i really like this comparison i always talk about minfilia as being the charles xavier of final fantasy 14. okay um people people don't like minfilia very much they think she's you know useless or whatever she's just an administrator like whatever you want to say but what minfilia questions. does is that she identifies people with the echo um that have this special power that can help you know save the world help um, you know, mitigate these problems or whatever, and brings them in, gives them a home, trains them. Um, most of them are like, you know, basically ostracized. And like Ga- Gaius, for instance, in 1.0, he was like, anyone that has the Echo is as good as a beast race, and they're on my hit list as well. You got to throw them out, you got to hand them over, you got to kill them. So they were like the X Men um, until the end of 2.0, where we defeat the Ultima weapon um, by basically um uh, uniting the grand companies in this joint military operation where we have to step into the lights and from then on we are now like commonly known and we're under scrutiny and we're kind of having kind of kind of like you know when the x-men sort of come out they're kind of having to deal with like the problems with that all these people that want to use them for political purposes sure. is like a major theme of ARR. Like an Avenger initiative um, problem, right? Where there becomes a yeah. political ramifications. Yes. I do yeah, pay attention exactly. to lore in other universes, just not in my games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. It's interesting. Um, geopolitically, it's not like, it's not been something that's super important to me. I, as somebody who's just mm-hmm. gameplay um, sensitive, Yoshi Pete mm-hmm. said that like, um, he said when they went back to do the ARR squish, one of the things he addressed was that there was like this fixed amount of gameplay that was supposed to be. There was this pacing when they built ARR that was just like this general rule. I pictured it like being on a whiteboard at the front of the room, like for every Mm -hmm. quest, there must be this many cutscenes, And for every Mm cutscenes, there must be this many of quests. And like, that was just a a rule by which they lived to get the content out the door. But as a Mm -hmm. result for somebody who's gameplay driven and skipping the cutscenes, it 
it artificially meant that there were these moments dealing with Waking Sands where they had to generate gameplay where there was not organically a need for gameplay. And so they mm -hmm. artificially created somebody who hated and despised Menphilia because it was just fetch quest, fetch quest, fetch quest, escape button, fetch quest, fetch quest, fetch quest, fetch quest. And like, I can tell mm -hmm. you in 5.3 when we got to take our like grand world tour with Olybus and you got to like mm -hmm. fight things, I was like, oh, we're going to get to kill Menphilia. We're going to get to kill Menphilia. And then, and then it, and then she was like standing off to the side and it's like, no, I, you didn't address <laughs> all of my inner frustration. Like everybody else was like, oh, this big payoff. It's amazing. Okay. You, I didn't you know get, what? I didn't get to let out the frustration that I had for fetching. It's, it's not Minfilia's fault. It's Lollarita's. <laughs> there, there is no etherite to Vespa Bay to the Waking Sands, right? Right. You either you either have to take the walk from Horizon or you have to go to Limsa and then take the boat Which from I Limsa. I did the porter right. every time. Most people, yeah, most people are in that position. Um, canonically, so Lollarito, um, I don't know if you know him, but he's um, uh, he's the richest man in Uldar and is also basically a gangster. Is his um, son the guy that was Starlight Festival this last season? Is no. that the same connection? Rich family. No. Okay, carry on. Um, I don't think so, no. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, he was like, there's this organization that I would very much like to be doing things for me, and they're not, so I am not going to sign the form to give them an etherite. So they are going to have to walk every time. Screw them. If they don't want to you know play with me if they don't want to you know give me my uh my cut then uh they can walk <laughs> how much are we talking how much does an aetherite cost like death stranding a style mm. can we as players get together and pay for a, a, <laughs> pay for an aetherite to be built the charlians <laughs> make them the the charlians make them the charlians like that's what the charlians we're talking do. a million gil 10 million gil 200 million gil a billion gil yeah. Oh, geez, I don't know. Probably, probably ten million gil. But the thing is, like Alfino and Alize, they could, they could make one. The Scions could make one. That's that's not the problem. The problem is that it's Uldar land, and Lollarito is the top dog. And if he says you don't get any threat, you don't get any threat. And that's that's why we move to Revenant's Toll and we move to the Rising Stones because we're like when when we come out to the world and everyone suddenly knows about the Scions, it starts to get so much worse. These people trying to like use us for their own political gain, where we're like, we need to get the hell away from Uldar and away from Lollarito and oh. to this this new like frontier settlement in the middle of nowhere, just to make sure that we can have an ether right. <laughs> You know, finding out that it was Eorzean paperwork doesn't make me mm -hmm. like the situation any better. It's even fetchier yeah. now. So thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that immersion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that wraps up That's our mistake. second one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I assume I'll have more questions. And so if whatever part of the world Ethos calls home and whatever time makes sense, we'll do this again. Um, Absolutely. I'll have more questions as I go because like on one hand, I'm filling in answers as I go. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, like, that middle section is just becoming more questioning. I, and then Sh Shadowbringers was like a very like 5.0. I enjoyed wholeheartedly outside of the Gra Graha reveal. I, I, that's the mm -hmm. only thing that I was like, it was like, da -da -da -da, and I was like, I don't, I don't know who that is. And, um, but like after that, like 5.1 had a few things I didn't know. And 5.2 had a few more. And then 5.3 had a few things. And then we introduced mm -hmm. Bojan Southern front. And I don't know why we're there or what's going on. And then we start to get into 5.4 and we have to start looking as we, as we've moved back more and more time to the source. And as we've started to come back and prepare for the next expansion, it's very clear. It's like, Hey, let's go ahead and lean on previous expansions again. And I'm immediately lost again. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to get through all this stuff because I'm aware that like, I want to enjoy the next expansion the way I did Shadowbringers. And if they don't do the same fan service of writing it for, you know, people like me that survive just on the wonderful gameplay this game has, I'm going to be lost. Mm -hmm. Um, so I appreciate you filling me in. Thank You're you. very welcome. I'm sure we'll have some more like specific questions <laughs> next time. Yes. Um, but uh, I'm so I'm so delighted that you're getting invested in it. So um, thank you everyone for watching, and I hope you enjoyed our little chit chat.